as Anthony said, uh, one of my favorite topics on which to speak with colleagues. And so we have we have quite a bit planned for today uh, over the next hour. We're going to talk about both the traditional immunomodulatory interventions that we have, but this discussion would not be complete if we didn't also discuss some of the newer medications available to us. And this presentation would not be complete given the topic last week of IMHA and ITP if we didn't also talk about some of the adjunct therapies including antiplatelet aggregation and anticoagulant therapies. That's uh, something that we will discuss after we finish our immunomodulatory therapy discussion. So it is important to really remember that all of these immune mediated diseases or autoimmune diseases if you prefer that term are uh, driven by an abnormal response of CD4 T cells. So these cells are going to produce all types of pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines that end up yielding other types of results, whether that is production of antibodies or formation of CD8 cells or your cytotoxic T cells, as well as you know, bringing uh, neutrophils into an area of inflammation under uh, the auspices of Muted. kind CXCL8. You may know CXCL8 as IL8, but unfortunately it has been renamed. So pictographically, again, we've got these CD4 T cells that are presented with specific antigen. And we all know from our discussion last week that sometimes we don't know what that antigen is. Obviously, there has to be one, but in terms of our idiopathic diseases, we often don't know what that is. Ultimately, those CD4 T cells become activated, they proliferate, and they do their job. And as a result of that job, we actually have some negative effects, marked tissue injury, for example. So we're going to start right off with a poll question. I'm trying to get a, a feeling of where each of you is with regard to your initial treatment. So Anthony, here's the first poll question. Unmuted. So we just launched that question, and uh, if I can read that out, because Chris can't see, which one statement applies to you regarding treatment of immune-mediated diseases? I tend to, <laughs> I tend to only initially prescribe a corticosteroid, including a corticosteroid, excluding a corticosteroid. So we're all uh, a bit corticosteroid fixated here, but I get the feeling that you're trying to say that there are other drugs apart from corticosteroid. I have no idea of what you're speaking. <laughs> Let's see what uh, people want to say. So we've got uh, a few more people voting. Actually, thanks very much for voting. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of more seconds. If anybody wants to vote, just click on which one best suits you. Um, we've got 65% who say I tend to only initially prescribe a corticosteroid, 27% including a corticosteroid along with presumably something else, and 8% who would be using other things. Okay. And, and that is uh, something that I expected to be the result. Uh, I would say that in my practice area, as well as probably throughout the majority of the United States, the numbers would be the same. And I'm going to challenge that number two should probably be the more prevalent response. Um, and we'll talk about that as we go through the rest of the webinar. So. I initially muted. talk about both traditional and newer immunomodulatory medications, so this slide just gives you an idea of the drugs that we are going to be speaking about, and we're going to start now with 
of course, corticosteroids. A lot of people, uh, when I ask them, how do steroids work, I usually get the response, well, they're anti-inflammatory. And yeah, that's great, but we're not actually using it chiefly for its anti-inflammatory properties. We're wanting to use it for its immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory therapies. And a lot of people forget how that happens. And uh, the major effects of these uh, meaningful doses of corticosteroids uh, are a result of inhibition of interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha release from our macrophages. Uh, and I just think it's important to truly understand how a medication works if you're going to use it. I also think it's important when we're speaking with parents about our prescription of uh, immunomodulatory doses of corticosteroids that we remember that uh, these effects do not happen overnight. Indeed, it can take up to 7 to 10 days for this type of effect that we're looking for. The good thing is in most parts of the world, corticosteroids, prednisone, dexamethasone, they're, they're very cheap medications. But we need to have an honest discussion with parents about the side effects. And I'm not going to focus on that because we all know what they are. My point is make sure that you or a member of your nursing team really does spend an appropriate amount of time performing client education so that you aren't uh, subsequently being wrung uh, by client after client complaining about the excessive panting or uh, the excessive thirst and frequency of urination. I'd also like to put in a reminder for people to remember the potency differences. For example, dexamethasone being 7 to 10 times more potent than prednisone. A lot of times uh, that is an easy thing to forget, but it can be a very serious uh, thing to overlook. So just to review how steroids work, their mechanism of action, we have a steroid hormone that crosses the cell membrane and binds to a cytoplasmic receptor that's associated with a heat shock protein. And ultimately this hormone receptor complex translocates into an intranuclear position to affect uh, DNA transcription and ultimately RNA translation so that we do see changes in pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokine production. I have included uh, traditional starting doses based on a prednisone scale. Okay. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time on corticosteroids because we all understand how important this class of medication is for these types of diseases. We all understand that we're going to use corticosteroids for patients with these diseases. But I want to emphasize that we have a lot of other options that can work synergistically with corticosteroids so that we may indeed get a more potent and positive effect at the same time we may be able to reduce our dose of corticosteroid faster so that parents are happier with us because the side effects either aren't as severe or aren't uh, having to be dealt with for as long. So azathioprine is a medication that is commonly reached for uh, in conjunction with prednisone or a form of corticosteroid in the state because it is a uh, significant blocker of T cell activation. It can actually even induce uh, T cell apoptosis. And if we look at how it works, it, you know, it, there's a breakdown into its active metabolite called 6-mercaptopurine. And that's what's doing all of these immunomodulatory uh, effects that we've just spoken about. But I also want to emphasize this fun little enzyme right here, which is called thiopurine methyltransferase. And interestingly, people can have a inherited deficiency in thiopurine methyltransferase, and this deficiency actually makes them quite susceptible to azathioprine toxicity. Well, interestingly, the cat 
can also have a markedly reduced TPMT activity. 